Hello, everyone. I'm Kim T. Ha, director of the Pennington Public Library. And thank you for tuning in today for our amazing New Jersey talk with historian Rick Gefkin. Now, we've had Rick present at the library before, but this is the first time we'll be hosting him via Zoom. I spoke to Rick recently, and he would really like to encourage everyone to have a more interactive experience and has asked that everyone please feel free to chat in your comments and questions in the chat window during the presentation. And I will relay them throughout the presentation as appropriate. Now, of course, we will have time after the program for Rick to answer any live questions that you may have. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Rick Gafkin. Rick has written numerous books, including Highland Beach, Gatewilt to the Jersey Shore, 1888 to 1962 with Chris Brenner, and Lost Amusement Parks of the North Jersey Shore with George Severini. He expects to publish slave stories from New Jersey in late 2020. He is a trustee of the Shrewsbury Historical Society, past president and a trustee of the Jersey Coast Heritage Museum at Sandless House, and a member of the Monmouth County Historical Association. Without further ado, welcome Rick, hello. How are you? I'm great, thank you, Kim, and hello everybody. And uh, thanks for joining us today on a busy, I hope for most of us, uh, I should say a re-busy summer day. Um, I think most of us are out and about. Um, so today, appropriately, of course, uh, in New Jersey, we're going to talk about some amazing facts of New Jersey. I hope that you are uh, going to enjoy. Uh, and as Kim mentioned, uh, please interrupt by chat, and either Kim or Tara will uh, forward your questions to me. And we're going to start to share this screen here. Here's a, a kind of an overview, uh, if you will, of our great state. Uh, theoretically, most of you are from New Jersey or are certainly living here now. And right about there where the star is, is where most of you are probably in the Pennington area over in uh, that part of our state. I'm about due east of you, right about here at the lower part of Monmouth County in a little town called Farmingdale. Uh, but I grew up up here in Hudson County, uh, was lucky enough with my parents who uh, brought my sister Nancy and I down the shore to the Highlands every summer, and thus began my fascination, I think, with New Jersey in general. Uh, and then over the years, as my life went on, I got to know a little bit more about New Jersey, which I love and I think you probably do too. So I'm sure you see some of these iconic images here uh, on the first screen the famous bridge into Trenton, Trenton makes the world takes, uh, referring to a lot of the manufacturing history in the Trenton area over here in our state. Up here in High Point, up this part of the state, up in Sussex County, uh, I hope you know that a little part of the Appalachian Trail actually goes through our state up there. And then of course, the long 121 mile area of what we all call the shore, Everybody else calls it beaches, but we claim the, the title of shore. So we're going to continue uh, as we can here um, with the next slide. And let's see, here we go. So I have to be honest with you that I learned an awful lot preparing for this in the last several weeks. Uh, some things that I had taken for granted that I didn't uh, know necessarily about New Jersey. Uh, for instance, our state flag, which I think you probably recognize, but I didn't know very much about the iconography of that flag. Uh, it turns out that it emblazons the state seal, which was actually created in 1777, way back in the beginning. And then the state flag, using that state seal, came along in 1896. Uh, but the images on the flag are quite interesting, I think. So, for instance, up here, the helmet and the horse, the heraldic imagery, represent our independence as a state. And as you would suspect, a lot of this comes out of the heraldic imagery of, of European uh, centuries. Uh, this woman on the left, uh, appropriately, of course, is Liberty, and she's holding a Liberty cap. You may be familiar with that imagery from the French Revolutionary pictures, those kinds of things. Uh, the woman on the right, and isn't it interesting that women are on our state flag? Uh, is the Roman goddess of grain, Sirius, uh, Ceres, I should say, from which word we get cereal, of course, that she represents, as you can see, prosperity. 
uh, the three plows refer to our agricultural heritage. We'll talk a little bit about that in a bit as well. Uh, and then of course, across the bottom, liberty and prosperity is our state motto. 1776 is the year we became, as you know, one of the 13 original colonies to become a state in our country. And then curiously, this guy who I never heard of until very recently is the man alleged to have called us the Garden State, named, a man named Abraham Browning of Camden. Uh, and he is alleged to have said, an immense barrel is our state filled with good things to eat and open at both ends. Pennsylvania is grabbing from the one end and New York is from the other. That was then, certainly not now. Uh, interesting nonetheless. So um, I'm going to ask you to kind of think about these as we go through. There are some things that, that related to our state. I knew a few. I did not know all of them. Maybe you do. For instance, we have a state animal. If you think for a second, you could probably guess that. It is not the squirrel. Uh, it happens to be the horse. Okay, uh, really close to where I live is Colts Neck. And I think out in your part of the uh, state, out in the West, there are uh, many horse farms as well. So that's our state horse. Uh, the state fish. I'm a saltwater fisherman, so I would have guessed something in the Atlantic Ocean, and I would have been wrong. It turns out it is the brook trout. Our state fruit. This one should be fairly easy, especially for those of us in the mid part of the part of the state. Uh, but of course, it is the blueberry. We've got a long tradition. I think we're probably the third state in the uh, nation as far as uh, blueberry production after probably Massachusetts and maybe Wisconsin. Ah, did you know we had a state dinosaur? Well, the reason we have a state dinosaur is one of the early dinosaurs that were excavated, or at least their fossil remains, uh, happened to be from Haddonfield. And there it is. And it's called the Hydrosaurus Fouquayi. The state bird. I'm sure you know this. No, no, that's my joke. It is not the state bird. Our state bird is actually the eastern goldfinch, which I wouldn't have guessed. I would have lost that one on Jeopardy. And the state bug is not the mosquito as I had pictured there, in fact. It is, luckily for us, the honeybee. Uh, there are many, many more. If you want to go on site to New Jersey State uh, uh, website, you'll find a whole lot of things that uh, I would imagine legislators have uh, passed from time to time uh, different symbols for our state, but I thought these were the most important ones. So how did we get our beginnings? Well, of course, there were Native Americans here, mostly the Lenape people. You may sometimes hear them referred to as Lene Lenape. Uh, they were here for probably at least 1,200 years before Europeans came. But by the time Europeans came uh, to this part of the world, uh, Jersey was actually divided into two parts, East Jersey, where I live, and West Jersey, over here, where most of you are right now. Uh, and it remained that way for a long time, primarily because it was administered out of New York City. So when the English took over from the Dutch in the, sixth, in the 17th century, um, New York and New Jersey were considered one colony province, uh, and over time, uh, we became, uh, actually in 1702, we became separate. Uh, the earliest statewide document was something called the Concessions and Agreements of the Proprietors. And these are two men, I think you're probably familiar with their name. 1664, uh, these two friends of the Duke of York uh, in England were granted this huge territory. And that is those men there. Uh, I like to think of them as the hair club for men people, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, you know them as Lord John Berkeley and uh, Sir George Carteret. Carteret had the eastern part of New Jersey and West Jersey went to uh, John Berkeley. Interestingly enough, these men didn't come to live here. They were more land speculators than anything else. And they wanted to carve up their little uh, entities into smaller uh, portions so they could sell and make some money. Uh, you probably know that Carteret's got a city name for him up here in, in our part of the state. Uh, but as I mentioned, 1702, 
uh, when uh, the proprietary government was turned over, because turned back to the British crown, uh, the Jerseys were united. And so began to be called New Jersey over time. So we're gonna skip ahead a little bit here in chronology. You may have seen this uh, back in the, 17, in the 1976 celebrations, but the New Jersey Historical Commission and a lot of other people, scholars especially, have referred to New Jersey as the crossroads of the American Revolution. And I think you'll, you'll probably be familiar with why that is. Uh, this iconic portrait uh, was actually painted in 1851 by a guy named Emanuel Leutze, German uh, American, uh, of Washington crossing the Delaware on Christmas Eve, 1776. Uh, it's an apocryphal painting, uh, probably uh, look very little like that with the exception maybe the Delaware was iced over that, that night. Um, but for the next several years during the Revolutionary War, quite a number of battles, important battles actually, were fought uh, in New Jersey during the Revolution, hence the name. So as a result of that crossing, uh, Washington attacked, uh, would have still attacked the old barracks in Trenton uh, that evening in 1776. Uh, Washington spent a lot of time in our state during the Revolution, I hope you know. Um, Battle of Princeton, not too far from Pennington, uh, the next year in 1777 was an iconic battle as well. Uh, it continued. I'll bet you know who Molly Pitcher is. Uh, she's a legendary person, probably a conflation of several women that were at the Battle of Monmouth in 1778. Uh, Again, George Washington was there and played a prominent role. Uh, and then a place I'm from, uh, where I was born actually, uh, was called Paulus Hook uh, in 1779, but you may know it as Jersey City. And there was an outpost there on the river, the Hudson River overlooking New York. And this outpost uh, by Patriot Rebels actually, uh, was uh, there so to watch troop movement, ship movement in uh, New York Harbor but there in fact was a battle up in there uh, in that area in 1779. And then probably famous to most everybody in the country outside of New Jersey too, was the horrible winter in Morristown where uh, George Washington and his troops wintered over um, right kind of on the eve of what would turn around to be uh, the ultimate victory uh, during the Revolutionary War. I want to draw your attention back to this original picture, though, because something interesting happens here. I'm not sure if Leutze knew it, but when he painted this image, you notice there's a black man right there in front of George Washington. Well, whether or not he understood the painter, who that actually was, it turns out he was a real person. And that person is this man here, and his name was Billy Lee. And surprisingly, Billy Lee was George Washington's personal slave who accompanied him all throughout the Revolutionary War and later, even in retirement, down to Mount Vernon. So as I think probably everybody here knows by now, many, many of our founding fathers, uh, including George Washington, who was a Virginian, of course, uh, were slaveholders. Uh, Billy Lee, Lee stayed by his side uh, for many, many, many years. Which brings us to this. Um, apocryphal image too. It's obviously not true. New Jersey was never part of the Confederacy, but in some real ways we may have been considered that. And that's because up until uh, a time that you'll find out very shortly, uh, we were uh, a slave state, which does surprise quite a number of people. Uh, and the reason for that is historic as well, of course. When uh, New York was founded by the Dutch in the island of Manhattan, okay, the Indians called it that, um, and in lower Manhattan down in what is now the, the uh, Bowery area down the Battery, uh, the Dutch founded uh, what they called uh, part of New Netherlands, New Amsterdam. And because they controlled this part of New Jersey too, soon after the Dutch founding uh, of that little outpost, uh, people were encouraged to start on the other side of the river, the other, the west side of the Hudson, to uh, take over some land. And uh, Dutch ordered slaves, Africans, from both the Caribbean, South America, and ultimately Africa, and brought them into New Jersey. 
that began way back in the uh, 17th century. So Rick, you I'm hello, Rick. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. It seems like your sound lowered. Uh, okay. Can you hear it better now? It seems to be still lowered. If you could see if you could increase it. I'm not sure what happened. Okay. Uh, I haven't done anything. I hope the internet connection is going to work. Okay. It's, it's up now. Now it's really loud. But whatever oh. you did, it went up for a moment. Can you speak? All right, let's try, try that a little better. Yeah, that's better. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. So north is in this direction of this old map. And here's New York City. You can see the battery down here. This nut island, nutting island, is actually Governor's Island. And across what was called the North River for a long time is Hoboke, which is Hoboken. And this neck here, Barren Neck, they were calling it, is actually Jersey City and Bayonne today. And this was part of the community of Bergen way back when. Uh, and it was actually before Hudson County was uh, separated, it was called Bergen County. And so when the Dutch encouraged uh, landowners to start to come in and take over and develop this land, they brought slaves with them. Uh, as early as the 1620s in Bergen, what became uh, Hudson County, but was then Bergen, uh, now Jersey City, is where slavery in New Jersey actually got its foothold. Here's an old drawing of uh, what is uh, uh, quite famous. I went to school in Jersey City at St. Peter's University. And uh, along Bergen Avenue is a very odd shaped street. Bergen Avenue goes pretty straight and then it opens up into the square. And it turns out that square is the remnant footprint of what was called Bergen, the original founding part of Jersey City. Um, and as time went on, all around the surrounding countryside, uh, these farms were, were coming along uh, and they were all uh, empowered by slaves. Uh, so this goes way back in our state history. Uh, ironically, fast forwarding another few hundred years, when the Underground Railroad got its way, when slaves were coming from the south uh, through the western part of our state, actually up through the Pennington area, they would cut across, you can see here, Delaware River off the map here. Uh, the routes were varied, but they would come up this way, get up to around your area, and then they would, uh, through a series of safe houses, the escapees would come across. Ultimately, they tried to get to Jersey City, places like that, so they could get across to New York and possibly up the Hudson River to Canada and freedom. Uh, that was a very active uh, escape route for the better part of half a century and more. Uh, you probably do know the most famous underground railroad conductor, Harriet Tubman, Many of you may have seen her film recently, the recreated film of her life called Harriet. She was a real person, dynamic person, uh, had spent some time in Cape May, disguised as a uh, maid in a hotel, uh, from which point she went back several, several times to uh, uh, Maryland and Delaware to free people and bring as many, they think, as 70 or 80 escaped people up through this underground railroad network. So she's certainly the most famous of the, uh, the people of that era. Startling fact for me, at least up until several years ago, was that it took New Jersey till January of uh, 1866 to finally abolish slavery officially and legally. We were the last Northern state to do that. And that had a lot to do with our agricultural roots. Slavery had persisted for 200 years in the state primarily as a way to uh, engender our agricultural background. And so the people that owned slaves, and it was a dwindling number over the years, of course, uh, by the time of the Civil War, as a matter of fact, there were probably fewer than two dozen slaves le left. But the entrenched powers that be were very adamant about not uh, endorsing abolishment of slavery. We did finally do that uh, with the passage of the 13th Amendment. So here's another uh, more recent map, but old enough still. Here's Manhattan on the right side, of course, the Hudson River. And right here in Hoboken, in a place called the Elysian Fields, of all things, uh, was where something very famous happened. And what that was, uh, and remains, is where perhaps 
the first organized baseball game was played. Okay, now there's some dispute about this, but in 1846, according to old newspaper reports, a team from New York called the Knickerbockers could not find a place to play. New York wasn't developed like this map shows. Uh, and they came across the river, short furry ride away, and they played a game of baseball, two words, against a team called the New York Nine. Uh, there are other organizations that claim that baseball had been, uh, and, and would have been, of course, earlier than that particular date since they had uh, organized teams. But that's generally considered to be the start of uh, professional baseball. And right here, right next to the Legion Fields, is what's always been Castle Point, uh, is an interesting phenomenon too. This guy you might recognize from his lack of a leg uh, was actually uh, Peter Stuyvesant. And when he was the Dutch governor of uh, New Amsterdam, way back in 1663, a couple hundred years before the baseball game, he granted this Dutchman a patent for the first brewery in New York, which was established in New Jersey, I should say, established at Castle Point. Whether that brewery led to baseball, I'll let you decide. And speaking of Hoboken, which we should, um, it claims, as you can see from their sign, the birthplace of not only baseball, but of the very famous American entertainer, Frank Sinatra. Uh, you probably do know that Frank Sinatra grew up in uh, uh, Hoboken. It's a picture of his wife, Nancy Barbata, way early in their relationship when he was a skinny little kid uh, taking the, uh, the 1920s and 30s by storm. Uh, I will confess to you that my mother met him at a place called The Cabin up in North Jersey where he was performing early, early in his career. Uh, a couple of other famous musicians uh, named Paul, only one of which is from New Jersey. Of course, you recognize Paul McCartney who is from Liverpool but this is Les Paul. And Les Paul uh, is credited as being the inventor of the electric guitar. He's from Mawa, way up in the northern part of our state, which if this view is correct, from which you can see because it's elevated New York City. Uh, Les Paul and Mary Ford uh, had some very early uh, hits that I can recall in the 1940s and 50s uh, with a lot of reverberation and technical wizardry. Uh, uh, Paul, Les Paul was a genius. Uh, when it comes to music, New Jersey guy. And uh, in this picture, of course, Paul McCartney is paying tribute to that, uh, that genius. I would be remiss living at the shore if I didn't mention probably the most famous contemporary mu musician uh, in our state these days, who with that iconic album uh, way back when in the 70s, uh, help revitalize, if you want to uh, think of it that way, Asbury Park. A uh, young guy named Bruce Springsteen. I can tell you he lives about five miles from my house. He never invites me over for barbecue. I'm, I'm greatly disappointed. Nonetheless, I'm a fan, uh, and you probably know that uh, he got a lot of his uh, original notoriety at a club in Asbury Park called the Stone Pony, uh, which is still there and looks remarkably like that today. Uh, he played there for many, many years. Uh, but that particular uh, venue goes back a whole lot further than that. It goes back actually into the 30s and 40s when it was uh, in Asbury Park called Mrs. J's, uh, owned by uh, Ida Jacobson. Um, and it had an outdoor beer garden. Uh, there are some stories I haven't been able to verify that Frank Sinatra may have appeared there back in the 40s. Um, but it's interesting, it always has been to me that this venue has stayed uh, as a music venue an iconic New Jersey location for many, many years. So uh, getting back to our sports theme for a while, New Jersey does enjoy some other firsts when it comes to sports that we all know and love. Uh, way back in November of 1869, very iconic uh, football game began, it's considered the first intercollegiate football game ever. Uh, between two college teams. There's a more contemporary uh, drawing of it. And as you probably remember, it was Rutgers scored six at their home field and beat Princeton that day, who only scored four points in a, in a different kind of scoring system. Uh, but that happened 
up in the New Brunswick area. Uh, about 27 years later, what's considered the first professional basketball game was uh, played and actually very close to where most of you are, was played in Trenton, where the Trenton team scored 15 points against the Brooklyn team, uh, one. I think those results would be uh, significantly different if the Brooklyn Nets came down in that part of the world today. Uh, this one surprised me. I sort of knew about that. Uh, the basketball game being the first uh, professional game I did not I did not know beforehand. Uh, going back to some inventors, I'm not sure if you knew this, uh, but two very, very important men to our military history, as it turns out, had New Jersey roots, uh, and they were the men who invented the submarine. Uh, this man here was actually a resident of New Jersey. He was actually an Irishman. This guy was, in fact, from New Jersey. Uh, the fellow on the bottom left coming out of his uh, prototype submarine was John Philip Holland. Uh, in 1883, he tested a uh, boat that he named after a uh, Irish organization. He called it the Finian Ram in the Passaic River up north. Uh, you could still see that particular submarine up in the Patterson Museum if you'd like to go visit that. This fellow, Simon Lake, uh, is actually from uh, down south. Uh, his family uh, was from uh, Atlanta County, but he wound up moving uh, to a place called Atlantic Highlands, not too far from me, where he, uh, in uh, 1894, did some experimentation on this ungainly looking submarine in the Navasink River, not too far from me. Um, and when I say ungainly, uh, draw your attention to the wheels because Simon Lake's uh, concept was that submarines would be boats that would submerge and roll around the bottom of whatever waterway. And in fact, that's what he did in the Navasink River in 1894. He and his cousin uh, in a wooden, yes, I said wooden ship with ballast, they submerged about 20 feet in the Navasink River and under some steam power uh, for about 20 minutes, they uh, traversed the bottom and uh, over time, he also became famous as a much more uh, advanced submarine uh, inventor. And the two of them vied for many, many years for a Navy contract. Holland won the first Navy contract. Simon Lake, over time, became a little bit more famous uh, into World War II. Uh, but they both have significant New Jersey roots. Rick? Yes. We have a question. Did Holland also work on the Holland Tunnel? Uh, no, that's a great question. A different person altogether. The Holland Tunnel was not named after John Philip Holland. Um, and I don't recall off the top of my head who the Holland Tunnel was named after. But I bet a quick Google search would solve that. Um, different, different naming altogether. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so New Jersey, as I'm sure you would recognize as a state so dense in population, uh, has important uh, it played an important role not only in the Revolutionary War, but ever since. And just some highlights of some places that I think you know, uh, <clears throat> maybe not by their former names. Camp Little Silver over here in Monmouth County started during World War I. Over time, uh, evolved to what became Fort Monmouth was a signal corps center. It's been decommissioned in the last several years. Uh, it looked like that at the end. It's now uh, partly in Tinton Falls, Shrewsbury, and also in Little Silver as well. Uh, also around the uh, First World War ter ter area was uh, what was called Camp Dix in the middle of the state, kind of between where you are and where I am, uh, is now called Joint Base McGuire Dix and also has a component in Lakehurst uh, where the, uh, the blitz took off from years. Uh, that was also a very, very active Army installation it's where I did my basic training action where I mustered out all those many years ago as well. You may have heard of Camp Kilmer, named after Joyce Kilmer, the poet. Uh, that was located uh, during World War II in the Piscataway Edison area. Uh, and it has evolved over the years to become a reserve uh, training area too. But these three, and there are some other outposts, of course, uh, are primarily contribute to our military effort in the World Wars. Uh, so. Uh, New Jersey folks have always contributed mightily to the military defense of our country.
we could not, when we talk about inventors of New Jersey, uh, talk about the most prominent New Jersey inventor, although he's originally from Ohio. In a very early picture, I'm sure you're going to recognize this man, uh, happened to be my boyhood hero, uh, that guy, Thomas Alva Edison, shown here with an early, early version of the phonograph. You'll probably recall that phonograph recordings were cylindrical uh, in the early days. Uh, he was called, called the Wizard of Menlo Park for, for lots of reasons. He held well over a thousand different patents on various kinds of inventions that he and his workshop of, of mostly men uh, are credited with creating. Uh, the highlights, of course, you, you know, 1878, he uh, is credited with inventing the photograph, uh, phonograph, I should say. Uh, although, in fairness, uh, a lot of these inventions had been prototyped by other people. Uh, Edison gets a lot of the credit for the ultimate perfections of these things. Uh, there he is at a much later point in his life with his iconic incandescent electric light. He also didn't invent the concept, but he was the first guy to publicly uh, and commercially market, uh, after many, many years of experiments, a bulb that lasted uh, for many years. Interestingly enough, also in New Jersey, where he was working at the time, uh, he uh, electrified the first Presbyterian church in Roselle uh, and is credited with being the first man to electrify a city. Uh, you probably know that he went on and to do a lot of greater things in places like New York City, um, and it changed the whole course of the world for that matter. Most famously, over time, uh, he founded the electric, the Edison General Electric Company. The General Electric Company uh, is uh, the one that we are all familiar with in our era, uh, came from his roots in 1890. And then just to show you how widely influential he was, uh, this place, which I saw when I was a kid, a Boy Scout, they had uh, done a reproduction of it. Uh, was called in 1893 in West Orange, the Black Mariah. Uh, and it was a movie uh, theater. Uh, we'll give you a little bit more about the history uh, in New Jersey of movie theaters in a second. Uh, right now, as a matter of fact, we'll talk about our film history. Uh, it turns out that uh, several years after uh, the uh, movies had been perfected uh, and they began to be filmed in uh, a more uh, audience pleasing format. In 1903 in Fort Lee, the film industry began. New York entrepreneurs and filmmakers decided they needed more space and came across the Hudson River to uh, Fort Lee. And uh, the roots of people like the Universal uh, Company began in Fort Lee with factories uh, where they would film uh, and produce movies. Uh, you probably have recalled, if you haven't seen some early, early episodes, although it goes back quite a ways, a century now, of something called the Pearls of Pauline. It was a serialized group of 16 little vignettes, and poor Pauline was always left at the end of these little movie trailers uh, in some ha uh, you know, hazardous position. And so uh, it would encourage you to come back to the theater the next week to find out if she was rescued, and she always was. Um, interestingly enough, one of those scenes was filmed here in Fort Lee at the what we all know as the Palisades uh, in one of her adventures. If you went there today, you can see exactly where that same scene was filmed, where Pauline was left hanging over a cliff for uh, in a week, allegedly. You can see the George Washington Bridge up here uh, in a modern uh, photograph. But we have even deeper roots than uh, just plain motion pictures. This thing, which you'll all recognize, uh, was actually the very first drive-in theater invented by a guy named Richard Hollingshead. He called it the Park Inn Theater in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, I don't think there are very many of these left anymore, but I certainly have a, a lot of fond memories of going to drive-in theaters when I was a kid. Uh, we'd be remiss, of course, in New Jersey if we didn't talk about our heritage at the shore. Uh, it goes way back uh, certainly uh, to the point in the 1850s where Atlantic City began to develop as a resort, uh, mainly by people from the Philadelphia area, actually, who would come over to seek the, uh, the cooling winds and the water of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, within a several years, uh, large hotels were erected uh, along the coast in Atlantic City, 
uh, the amusements and all the things that we're familiar with came much later. Uh, but that led to a couple of innovations, including the boardwalk. The boardwalk was invented in uh, Atlantic City primarily because hoteliers were tired of people coming in from the beach, draining sand in their feet, ruining the rugs in their hotels. So uh, a man decided if he could build a boardwalk, perhaps the sand would come from people's feet and they would shake it off before they got in their uh, hotels. Um, that's a tradition that's survived not only in New Jersey, but a lot of other places since then. Uh, over time, as you would expect, huge, even bigger hotels uh, were erected in Atlantic City, even before it became the, the gambling mecca that we know in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, crowded beaches. And then I recall, and I'll bet some of you do too, going down to the Steel Pier, where they had the famous diving horse uh, act. Uh, as far as I know, the horse never had a commentary on how he or she felt about that. Uh, soon to follow Atlantic City success with Long Branch in the 1860s, that became very famous as a resort, uh, became over time known as the uh, uh, area of the uh, Beach of the Seven Presidents. From uh, U.S. Grant on, seven different presidents summered there uh, at the shore in Long Branch. Long Branch was very, it had a big promontory hill here. People would stroll the beaches, oddly enough, in those kinds of outfits. And this is a Winslow Homer drawing from uh, probably the 1870s or so. And as I mentioned, uh, Grant had a cabin. Uh, we, he called it a cabin. We would call it a mansion uh, on the beachfront in a Long Branch for many years. It was taken down several years ago. And then I hope you do know that the famous saltwater taffy actually uh, had its origin in New Jersey. Allegedly, during a hurricane in the 1880s, a confectioner at uh, Atlantic City's uh, candy stock was saturated during a storm, and he renamed it cleverly saltwater taffy. Uh, and uh, these iconic boxes that we used to buy when we were down the shore at Asbury Park and other places uh, became associated with New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey, as you probably know, just about every little town along the shore over the next hundred years after these first two developed resorts came, uh, attracted and wanted to attract summer visitors. This is an 1891 picture of a place that you probably know if you recognize that. Those are the twin lights of Highlands. Uh, and this, from this vantage point, it looks like it's part of the mainland, but this is actually Sandy Hook Peninsula here. And right here, I wanted to draw your attention to that structure. In 1891, it was about three years old. Uh, and that was called the Great Switchback Railroad, a couple of years old. Uh, and it looked like that. And it was one of the first prototypes of what became roller coasters uh, that were, was put up there specifically, by the way, by a guy named Sandless to attract people to come down uh, during the summer so that his partner, a guy named Ferdinand Fish, could sell land uh, and develop this part of the northern shore. Uh, this great switchback railroad cost you a nickel. You would go up the platform into a chair here. They would push you down by gravity. You would go to the other platform. They would push you back up uh, at the astounding speed of six miles an hour, which scared you uh, immensely since nothing other than a train and a horse in those days was going quite that fast. Uh, this led later on, many years later, to roller coasters of uh, immensely greater speed up and down, uh, not only our coast, but all over the country. Uh, to talk about our famous educational heritage, 1756, the College of New Jersey was established. Uh, this is Nassau Hall, one of the first buildings over there. Again, quite close to your part of the state. Uh, a little bit north of me and my daughter's alma mater was Queens College 10 years later. Uh, remarkably similar architecture to the, to the uh, central building, the learning hall there. Uh, they're considered world-class universities now because we know them a whole lot better, don't we? As Princeton University and Queens College has been renamed Rutgers University, uh, b both famous. And although Princeton is, of course, one of the original eight Ivy League schools, 
uh, it turns out that many, many folks consider uh, Rutgers on par with Ivy League education almost everywhere. Just some famous graduates, and there are many, many, many. Woodrow Wilson not only graduated from uh, Princeton University, but as you know, became its president and then our president later uh, in the early 20th century. I did not know until recently that Jimmy Stewart was a graduate of Princeton. Michelle Obama was a graduate of Princeton. Not to be outdone, Rutgers brings its own uh, alumni. Uh, you probably do know Paul Robeson, uh, quite quite famous in many, many uh, athletic and uh, educational and public spirited uh, endeavors. Uh, Carly Lloyd from our uh, world famous and world class uh, US soccer team is a Rutgers graduate, as is Natalie Morales, you might know from TV. Uh, uh, she's been a newscaster for many years as well. Uh, I would encourage you to look, uh, if you can, at some graduates from these two schools. You would be blown away by the number of very famous people that come out of New Jersey uh, in our educational institutions. So let's talk about New Jersey uh, in the 21st century. Um, we all know what's happening uh, these days. Uh, we're all at home, and thank you for attending this on uh, what I would presume would be a day when you would normally be outside or at the beach. Uh, but we are uh, observing what we have to do during the pandemic. Uh, our state today is still in New Jersey, uh, as New Jersey, the most populated, densely populated state in the country. Somewhere around 9.2 million people living in a small, small area, as you know. I like to think of it as everything being uh, an hour away from everything else in New Jersey. Um, and when I looked at this uh, couple year old population uh, distribution, it doesn't surprise me, I hope not you, that when you look at current pandemic maps, it mirrors this pretty accurately. And that's because the nearness to New York City up here in the northern, uh, northeastern part of our state is a densely populated area of bedroom communities uh, for New York primarily. Down here in Monmouth County where I live, many, many people, including my father for many years, commuted to New York, a uh, large population area. And then of course on this part of the state, the Camden, Princeton, up toward you, uh, Trenton, Corridor, also a population center uh, that supports the greater Philadelphia area as well. Uh, and then, of course, down in the Atlantic City area. Uh, but very similar to what's happened, unfortunately, in this pandemic when it comes to uh, casualties and hospitalizations. We have, uh, because we're such a diverse state geographically too, we uh, have terrain as far north up here, the Delaware Water Gap area, which is kind of the mountain area, the high point of the state. And then of course, our famous Jersey Shore uh, all along here that people from just about everywhere, including as I hope you know, Canadians have been going to Wildwood for many, many years uh, because of the, the pristine beaches. And you know too, of course, that the water is increasingly cleaner over the years. Uh, it remains to be seen how popular the beaches will be this summer. I have a feeling they're going to be very popular again very quickly. Uh, but because of our uniqueness, uh, probably uh, Newark Liberty Airport contributes to that, as does Philly Airport, the New York airports. New, uh, newly arriving immigrants come into our state with quite a lot of frequency, as they have been for, for many, many years, decades. Uh, and I saw this chart, which is very interesting, uh, you know, seven or eight years old now. Uh, but my guess would be probably 25% of the folks in our state today, maybe more, uh, were originally born uh, somewhere else in the world. Uh, that contributes mightily, I think, to our, uh, our population and all the uh, things that we do for the country and the world. Uh, you probably know that we've also been a hub for years and years for the pharmaceutical industry, particularly up in the Hanover area, but also in the Princeton area. Uh, among the, the notable names is Merck Pharmaceuticals and, and quite a number of other companies as well. Um, because of our proximity to New York uh, and because people increasingly over the years have wanted to live in New Jersey uh, but work in New York, uh, several years ago, downtown Jersey City, where a lot of this began, oddly enough, uh, in what's called Exchange Place Financial Area here in the Hudson, has become its own financial district. Uh, and many, many 
New York uh, financial firms and real estate firms, et cetera, uh, are now uh, located in headquarters across the river uh, on our side. So in summary, to me, I, I absolutely believe as a lover of this place uh, that we are emblematic of the American dream in so many ways, uh, mostly positive. Uh, we've got a way to go, as you're all aware of these days, to address some other things, uh, but I'm pretty confident that we will. Uh, so with that, I'm going to open up to uh, Tara and to Kim for any questions that may have come in. Uh, I'll give you a little commercial here, a couple of books I've written. If you're interested in a signed copy of those, uh, there's my email. You can send me a note, and I'll be glad to uh, inscribe and send those out to you if that's appropriate. Uh, so Kim and or Tara, uh, any questions from anybody? I'd be glad to, glad to talk to them. Thank you so much, Rick. That was so informative. I didn't know about you know, the boardwalk or about the horses and about the submarine. I mean, all these very interesting tidbits about New Jersey. I guess I have a question about your process. You've written a number of books, as we see here, and you have an upcoming book that is anticipated. What, what process do you go to to do this research? So it's pretty, uh, you know, it, it was organic at first. Uh, as I mentioned, I grew up in North Jersey, but spent a lot of time at the shore and just had visited places like Twin Lights here in this, in this old image you saw. Uh, and so uh, uh, I began to get interested. And then uh, one of the people on, on our, uh, our list today is a guy named Gary Soretsky, a friend of mine who is a retired uh, Monmouth County archivist. And uh, the holdings in the Monmouth County archives that he ran for many, many years, uh, just it's a treasure trove of things and I was there for for a long time uh, researching you know oddities that I was interested in found out that there's just so much more and more and more uh, and I'll be qu quite candid uh, preparing for this for the last few weeks uh, that whole thing about state symbols and our flag I peripherally knew a little bit about it but as I dug in a little deeper uh, it became more fascinating uh, there's an endless variety of course, with Google these days, you can find out just about anything. But local libraries, can I give a plug for a local library? Would that be good? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Thank are, you. Uh, are great places. I have spent a considerable part of my life in libraries. I remember distinctly getting the adult library card at the North Bergen Library when I was about 10 or maybe 12. Uh, and they continue to be wonderful resources. Uh, I don't know about your library, but I'll bet you have a New Jersey section there. We do. We have a New Jersey room. Thank you for plugging us. This is great. You know, Gary just commented. He wants to thank you for the shout out as well. And we have several people just thanking you for the informative lecture and just everyone's learning a lot. I don't think anyone has many questions, but feel free to well, I see chat them in. Three, I see three chats here. I don't know if anybody's got, uh, got any other questions, but I'll, I'll hang along as long as people yes. want. While we wait for people to chat in their questions, I just wanted to, speak of plugs, plug some of our upcoming programs, if that's okay, Rick. Oh, please. Yes, so next Sunday, June 14th at three, we will have 2019 Stellhorn, New Jersey History Award recipient, and may I add, former library volunteer, Jordan and Tebby, presenting his talk entitled, Trenton's Urban Renewal and the Struggle for Community where he will detail several actors in Trenton, New Jersey, who opposed urban renewal locally and nationally during the 1950s and 60s. So we're very excited about that, having Jordan join us next week, next Sunday. And you're gonna do that by Zoom as well? Yes, we will, we will do it by Zoom, yes. Oh, there's a question. Now, why doesn't New Jersey have a state song? Do we have a state song? Well, that's interesting. Um, and I have to go back into my memory bank. I'm not sure that we, we have an official state song. Uh, I know that for some years, uh, it was uh, pushed to the legislature that Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run be ah. that song. I think, some, I think some people objected to that. Um, <laughs> primarily because it's a song about leaving New Jersey. So <laughs> I'm not sure that would be appropriate. But uh I don't know that we do. If anybody on on uh, on the presentation knows that we have yeah. to do I'd like to uh, I'd like to hear about that. Yeah, that's funny because I'm from Maryland originally, but um, my former car I named Bruce 
because um, I, I bought him right after 9-11 and I was listening to a lot of Bruce Springsteen then. And so I named my car Bruce at that time. <laughs> yeah, he's your former, your former car. My former car. Oh, my former car. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He lasts me a great number of years though. Next time you're on my part of the state, we'll take a ride and we'll, we'll go by Bruce's house. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Rick. Tara suggested that the song should be Jersey Girl. <laughs> well, you know, who would argue with that? Yeah. I would, I would. Yeah. We have other people concurring that they like that idea. I do too. Great suggestion, Tara. <laughs> um, I also have another plug. You know, we have a lot of programs coming up. On Friday, June 19th at 4, we're having a virtual visit with our animal friends from Eyes of the Wild Zoom Zoo. And I don't know if you're familiar, Rick, but for years now, uh, we've been having this traveling zoo come to our Pennington holiday walk. And now we're inviting them to present via Zoom. So we'll be hosting animals like sugar gliders, a porcupine, a wallaby, and this program is sponsored by the Friends of the Pennington Library, and we wanted to support our friends at Eyes of the Wild. All of their animals are rescue animals, so the presentation fees will go to the care of these rescue animals. Now, will the animals be doing their own narrations? <laughs> you know, we have a great, that, that's so funny, we have a great presenter. They have great presenters, um, and very informative, too, in terms of biology wise and Travis is their main presenter and he normally comes to our presentations and not only is he presenter he's a comedian as well he's had me in stitches I've been like on the floor laughing and yeah. you know so he's great gonna, I hope you're going to send out a link to everybody that's on today's uh, call as well right yes yes we definitely everything is located on our website at penningtonlibrary.org I'm still working on a flyer for the zoo program but I will definitely send that out to everyone May, may I ask while I have you, and uh, not only as a plug, but just as a, a point of information, are there sure. any plans yet to open the library up to the public as formally? You know, that is a very good question. And we are monitoring, of course, what the governor is putting out. And not only that, the state library is giving us guidance. And so we are currently in a state where we are putting together a, a staged plan for the library, a phase-in plan. Yeah. And we're just taking into consideration everyone's safety, uh, the safety of our staff as well. So yeah. I hope that gives you some answer. Uh, well, to your, it, yeah. It's similar to what everybody else is doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I will say uh, again, and uh, at the risk of sounding gratuitous, libraries over the years, in my experience, uh, you know, I began to go to libraries for books, but they become community centers and such a vital part of our communities all over the state that I'm familiar with that uh, they're invaluable. Uh, so I can't wait for you to get back on uh, on a normal track if you, if you were. Thank you, thank you very much. But we're, we're working hard behind the scenes. I don't know if the audience knows, but we are a historical library and we serve Pennington, but we also serve the surrounding areas. And we are a staff of three part-time volunteers, or sorry, three part-time staff, but then we have like 30 some volunteers. And since this pandemic, we've been basically running on a skeleton staff, so. Now, do you have a friends group too? We do, yes, we have a friends group and they are how, very How supportive. would people get involved in that? Well, if you go to our website, there's a friends section. If you'd like to donate to the friends, that would be much appreciated. And also there is a contact form on our website to reach out to the, the friends. Yeah, many of the libraries in my part of the state that I'm familiar with do the same thing. They depend on the friends of their particular library for volunteer services, financial contributions, etc. And I have a feeling that probably now more than ever, you're going to need that assistance. Yes, definitely. Thank you. And I had a comment about libraries reinventing themselves, like you mentioned, um, Rick. And I've been a librarian since 2007, and that trend has you know, as long as I've been a librarian, um, that trend has been moving that direction. So I've been programming since, you know, I, I graduated from library school. So, <laughs> so well, yeah. You know, I wish there were a better term. Older folks like me, when I hear library, we think books and that kind of thing. But really, uh, to me, and, and it's been obvious for a number of years, libraries are, are, are the way that the culture is perpetuating uh, throughout communities and, and in this case, the state. So. Uh, they're the repository of, uh, as our archives, of so many great things that uh, 
you know, you don't have to read the newspaper these days to know that you can't know enough about the history of uh, any civil war time. Yes, thank you. Your volume has lowered again, but I'm not sure. Internet, I'm not sure why. Yeah, but I don't see any other questions. Uh, there are comments about whether Zoom will continue. Um, we are working toward that as well, as thinking about the future of, of where we will move forward with, with the technology now that we have that set in place. So we definitely are looking toward offering more options for programs in the future. Thank you so much, Claudia, for that you comment. Record, you recorded this session too, right? Yes, this okay. session has been recorded. Your volume is back. Rick, okay. sounds okay. great. And I think other than that, if you have any other further comments, Rick, Tara, if you have any further comments or any other questions, I think that that is all I have. Terrific. Well, I want to thank everybody and thank you, uh, Kim and Tara, for setting this up. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. And, uh, hope to see you in the future. Yes, thanks, Rick. Yes, that is great. Rick, you know, you have other talks and so we'll be in touch. Um, for those of you, I know some of you have contacted us about, you know, talks that you may have. I know there are presenters out there, a lot of presenters out there. And just know that we have a running list and we are looking into booking as many people as we can um, with the time that we have. So we will be in touch if you're interested in presenting as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. It looks sunny outside and beautiful. Please go outside and get some fresh air. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you the next time via Zoom. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Rick.